flashlight was on, and I was getting text messages from the audience <laughs> telling me my flashlight was on. Technology is great sometimes, most of the time. Oh, don't turn that down. I want to hear me. You have to hear me, but I don't have to hear myself. Well, that's great. Well, we have a lot to accomplish this morning, so I hope you're ready. And we started almost on time, so we should have time to get it all done. I am glad you were here. What? What? It's not our fault. No. Or change. <laughs> I'm going to say it, but since you got it out there, yes, it's not your fault today. Congratulations. <laughs> there is no award for being on time. No. Well, we'll be late next week. <laughs> we can start extra late next week, so. Now don't confuse me, I'm trying to do stuff up here. As, uh, I have a very short attention span and very little brain, but Winnie the Pooh, is it? Very little brain power? I can't tell you what I'm looking for. I, I know it's here. I know what I'm looking for. I just can't tell you where it is. Ah, here we go. Good. All right, lots to say, lots to do. First things first, two weeks ago we missed a birthday. Ross had a birthday and I forgot all about it. So we got to sing happy birthday to him. And Ashana was here, we'd sing happy birthday to Kurt. She service. encourage you to join us if you can. Wednesday we'll be here at 6 for the young people for a youth hour and 7 o'clock will be Bible study time. Uh, and then uh, a few weeks from now there is uh, our camp ministry and I actually printed off forms if you're looking for one I just forgot to put them out so we can uh, get those for you after church if you're looking for a form. There's teen camp forms and there are family camp forms so uh, you can uh, grab one of those after if you remind me. And then in just a week and a half or so, a little over a week and a half, we're going to have our children's vacation Bible school. And uh, there are forms, uh, there are advertising flyers, and there's a little form on the back if parents want to fill them out to register, or they can go to the website and register, or you can just show up here on Thursday, July the 7th and register. But if you want some of those, we have a lot of these uh, around, and we're going to try to give some of them out. So you can uh, take those and share them with people and invite people to come. Uh, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, uh, we're just going to have a vacation Bible school prep time for our uh, midweek meetings. We will not have our youth hour and Bible study time. We will have decorating time and prayer time to get ready for VBS. So that will be a week and a half from now, uh, just so you know that. And uh, be much in prayer about it if you want to help us out. There's always a few little jobs to do during that week. We will start Wednesday, July the 7th, no, Thursday, July the 7th, 1 o'clock. We'll have a two-hour program uh, for whatever children are here. And then it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 1 to 3 in the afternoon. And then Sunday morning, July the 10th, we will try to get whatever children can come to bring their uh, parents or grandparents or whoever they want to bring here for our Sunday morning service. And uh, for me personally, it's my favorite church service of the year because it's the most fun. And uh, I like having a little bit of fun. So I encourage you uh, to be in prayer about it. Uh, invite some uh, children to come along if you can. Be here to help. And, uh, but most of all, pray that we have a great time and be able to share the gospel with as many people as possible. So that will be happening uh, July 7, 8, 9, and 10. All right, I know there are some people that enjoy having as much fun as I do, and uh, some of you weren't here last week because we told dad jokes because it was Father's Day. So I thought I'd share some, just because some of you weren't here. And some of them are very spiritual because they're from the Bible. How does Moses make his coffee? Hebrews. It, yeah, they're Hebrews. What time of day was Adam created? I like this one. A little before Eve. Oh, see? so good. The greatest comedian in the Bible, Samson. He brought the house down. <laughs> it's just awesome. 
Uh, this is one of my dad's favorites. Which Bible character had no parents? Joshua. He was the son of none. <laughs> and who was the shortest? This is my dad's, one of my dad's favorites. Who was the shortest man in the Bible? You'd think it was Nehemiah, or Nehemiah, but it wasn't. Some people think it was Bildad the Shuhite, one of Job's friends, but it was not. It was Habakkuk. As he said in chapter 2 and verse 1, I will stand upon my watch. <laughs> you have to be short to stand on your watch. Uh, the first baseball game was in the big inning, Genesis 1 1. Or, and the first tennis match was when Joseph served in Pharaoh's court. <laughs> so, those are the, the spiritual ones, if there's such a thing. Uh, What's well, orange and sounds like a parrot? A carrot. Carrot sounds like a parrot. Where does a sick fish go? To the dock. Yeah. What does a tick and the Eiffel Tower have in common? They're both parasites. You'll think about it, you'll get it. I used to be addicted to the hokey pokey, but I turned myself around. <laughs> My granddad always told me that things could be worse. I could fall into a deep hole full of water. I knew he meant well. <laughs> Does your face hurt? It's killing me. <laughs> All right, so I had to get rid of that because today, we're going to carry on with that theme. The joy of the Lord is your strength will be our theme verse for this morning. And uh, we're going to look in the book of Nehemiah again, and uh, I hope that you will be helped and encouraged this morning by your time in God's Word. Thank you so much for being with us, and let's pray together and ask the Lord to help us today. Lord, it's so good to be in your house, and we thank you for the joy that we can have through Jesus Christ, the only true joy. Lord, there are people in our world today that are searching everywhere for some joy, wanting some peace and satisfaction. Lord, they're looking in all the wrong places. Lord, help us to look to you for our joy today. Help us to find it in you. Help us to live it every day. Lord, we pray now as we gather together to worship you this morning that your joy would be manifested in our hearts and lives today and will help us throughout this week. Lord, we pray it in your wonderful and most precious name. Amen. We're going to start out this morning by singing two choruses, so you won't need your hymn book. The words will be on the screen. But let's uh, stand together. And uh, this uh, little chorus is based on Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Oh. 
on those choruses. If you take a Bible, we'll go to the book of 1 John. That's towards the end of the New Testament. In the book of 1 John. We're just going to read the first four verses together of 1 John. I'd like you to read them out loud with me, if you would, please. The book of 1 John in the New Testament, just before the book of Revelation, you'll find 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. You'll find 1 John. We'll start at verse 1, and we'll just read to the end of verse number 4. 1 John chapter 1, let's read, starting on verse number 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write me unto you, that your joy may be full. These things write me unto you, that your joy may be full. We have the written word of God today, so that our joy may be full. Let's sing about that joy. If you take your hymn book now, and find number 283. We'll sing joy unspeakable and full of glory. You may remain seated. Scriptural music, 
And uh, I remember when I was young, I had one cassette tape. I'm trying to date myself now. I had one cassette tape, Patch the Pirate Goes West. And, uh, but, uh, and I can still quote some of that. I listened to it so many times. Uh, but the Lord used him at, at, after he, shortly after he had his surgery, and, uh, he wrote this song, Oh Rejoice in the Lord, He Makes No Mistake. And it's interesting now to see uh, he is battling, is it Alzheimer's? Dementia? Alzheimer's. Some kind of dementia, and uh, he is at home, uh, but he basically uh, can't uh, recognize or remember most people. He uh, sometimes knows his wife. Uh, and just to know that all through his life he has trusted God and God is still taking care of him and still using him even in this state as his wife is uh, uh, just, she's kind of keeping everybody up to date as to how he's doing. But uh, great truth to this song, Oh Rejoice in the Lord. Let's sing it together. Fury. He was supposed to be here today preaching. Uh, he called me 
Thursday night and he said, I've got bad news. My wife's father just had a heart attack and we don't know what's happening. And his, her wife's, his wife's father is in Texas. And uh, he said, we're not sure what we're going to do. And I said, well, you have to go. And he's like, well, I don't know. We'll see. And then within the hour, uh, family had called and said, you need to come. Uh, this is a serious situation. So they left Thursday evening to begin driving to Texas. And uh, it's about 1,700 miles, I think he said. And uh, so they, while that first night, uh, they, her father did pass away that night. So uh, they continued on down to be there for a funeral. They arrived there yesterday evening and uh, we're disappointed they're disappointed we'd love to have them here but uh, the Lord's timing is perfect uh, he had everything taken care of at his church he was going to be away for a week anyway so it wasn't a major emergency situation for his church and uh, things are taken care of and they're able to go there so we need to pray for uh, pastor and mrs. Fury just a, a difficult time a few difficult days now and then they still have to travel home so I, I don't think uh, they won't be able to get here anymore this summer. This was the only time they could squeeze in a trip out here. Uh, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to get them uh, to come out again. But if you could pray for uh, Pastor and Mrs. Fury uh, and their, her family, especially during this time, uh, that would be much appreciated. We're praying for uh, Grace Baptist Church in Corner Brook. Uh, Pastor Matt Northcutt has been there for one year. And uh, they're having an anniversary Sunday today, and Pastor Holman, uh, Sarah's father, is actually out there preaching for them today. And, uh, but they're uh, excited about what the Lord is going to do for them there at Corner Brook. And we're also going to pray for Cornerstone Baptist Church in Parabineer. Uh, I had, they're doing a major renovation on their auditorium this coming week. They have a few people coming to help, and I told them, I'd love to help you, but I have company. Now I don't have company. <laughs> So now I have to go. <laughs> so tomorrow uh, I'm going to go to uh, Carabineer and spend two or three days up there. Uh, they're going to totally renovate their auditorium. They're, they're taking, they have windows at the front that they're going to take out and put on the side. Uh, they're going to reconfigure all the lights. They have these foot square ceiling tiles that are stapled on. They're taking all that down, jib rocking the entire ceiling. Uh, they're tearing out all the floor. They have a baptistry tank kind of in the floor, in the corner. They're tearing all that out. They're carrying out a classroom that's there. It's just, it's a major redo of their auditorium. So I asked Pastor Minion, I texted him the other night, I said, no, my company is not here, so I feel like I have to come because he's made two trips down here to help me do shingles, and uh, that's not an easy job. So I feel like I owe him a little. And uh, I said, when would be better for me to come, early in the week or late in the week? And he said, early in the week. And I know why, because early in the week is demo time. And I'm good at breaking things. <laughs> I told somebody that I'm not very smart, but I got a strong back and I work hard. So I, they're going to get me to do all the hard, heavy duty work, lifting and all that, and then let other people take care of the finicky, fun, finish type stuff, because that's not my forte. So anyway, uh, I'm going to go up for a couple days. So uh, pray about that. They've got some people coming in. Uh, Phil and Susan Smith, who were here a couple years ago, and helped us do some work in our hallway. They've come, and actually they have a couple with them from Pastor Fury's church in Simcoe uh, that uh, is traveling with them for a few weeks and uh, uh, going around and working on uh, a few churches. So uh, I know some other people from the island from here in Newfoundland are going to go help, uh, and so I'm going to go and try to be a help to them over the next couple of days, so we need to pray about that. So let's take a moment and uh, pray together this morning. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy, which you showed to us again this morning. And for the privilege of being here in your house. And now, Lord, as we lift up these needs before you, we know that you are the only one that can truly help. And Lord, we pray this morning for Pastor and Mrs. Fury and how much uh, grief and sorrow now, Lord, they are going through. They would much have rather been here and enjoyed a, a trip than they're visiting here and preaching for us today. But Lord, your plan is perfect, and we just ask that you would give them grace and strength for these days and that you would help them. Lord, we pray for Cornerstone Baptist Church in Carbonier over the next few days as much work will be happening. I pray that you'd keep everyone safe who is working there. Give Pastor Minion wisdom as he leads that, and Brother Smith and the others who work. The Lord, please uh, help their renovations to go smoothly, and uh, it would be a benefit to their church. Lord, we pray for Grace Baptist Church in Cornerbrook. I thank you for Pastor Northcutt. And I pray that you would bless he and his wife and their two children as they serve you there. And I thank you for their willingness to come here to Newfoundland and serve you here. And I just pray that you'd bless the services today as Pastor Holman preaches and bless uh, their continued ministry there. Lord, help us here to be faithful as we uh, look forward to our summer ministry of uh, Vacation Bible School, and it would be an opportunity to reach 
and more people in our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray for Beth and Holman and my brother Ross and Marie's sister Lois as they continue and with treatments and recovery from cancer. I pray that you'd strengthen their bodies and help them. We pray for the little family as they prepare to move to New Brunswick and take over a new ministry there. Just give them uh, wisdom and grace and strength to meet their needs. Lord, we pray for the Connors in Vancouver and bless City Baptist Church today. Lord, help us to be faithful in giving of our tithes and offerings, praying for one another and uplifting one another, and being faithful to you as we are able. We ask now that you'd help us for the rest of this service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 275 in your hymn books. We're going to sing, It Is Well With My Soul. After that, we'll move right into our theme song, Grace. Let's stand together and sing 275, It Is Well.
appreciate you being involved in singing. Thank you, ladies, for the good piano music this morning to help lead and encourage. Find Nehemiah chapter 1 in your Bible, if you would, please. Nehemiah, not chapter 1, chapter 8, sorry. Nehemiah chapter 8. We're back at Nehemiah again today. There's a thought that stayed with me this week. A thought kept coming to mind as I... <clears throat> as I heard of more sorrow. And uh, Thursday when Brother Fury called me and said, you know, her, 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 his wife's died. Dad had, uh, was sick and then eventually passed away. Earlier in the week, I meant to put it in our prayer list and I forgot to do it. Uh, there is a young family, their last name is Weeb. Uh, they're helping a family in Uranium City, Saskatchewan. I meant to look it up, but it's way north in Saskatchewan. It's a fly-in community only. Uh, there's a man up there, his last name is Pfaffenroth. He's been up there a lot of years. He and his wife building a church and ministry and a camp. His daughter and son-in-law and four or five children have been up there helping them. And this past week, their eight-year-old daughter drowned in a pond that was on the campground. And uh, I just I saw an email about it on a preacher's group I'm on, and I just and I did actually see a part of the funeral yesterday. They had a live stream on Facebook. Just it's a fly-in only community, so they they had to do something uh, right away. So they're going to have a memorial service later in uh, uh, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, for this little girl. Uh, but you know we, the war that's been going on. There's stories of loss and pain all around the world. There's you know we hear of shootings. And, you, you watch the news and you just want to get discouraged. You want to be downhearted. You want to be, you know, it's just how can you be joyful when you think about some of these things? And uh, the phrase kept coming back to my mind, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. And I, had, I went looking for it. I didn't know where it was. I knew it was in the Bible, some form of it. And I was using my Bible program that I do some searching and I, I couldn't uh, find it. I, kept, I couldn't get the exact wording. I was looking, looking. Finally, I found it in Nehemiah. And uh, I don't have Nehemiah yet in my Bible open. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Ezra, Nehemiah. All right, it's in here. In Nehemiah chapter 8, if you found it, verse number 10, it says, Then, said he, then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, from a few weeks ago, those of you that were here, I think it was three Sundays ago, uh, we were in the book of Ezra. And we looked at Ezra chapter 9 and verse 8, where uh, Ezra said to uh, the people... And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God. And the story was that Israel had committed great sin, and God was now giving them a space, a time of grace, where they could confess and forsake their sin. He gave them some grace space. Time to make things right. And then two Sundays ago, uh, we were in Nehemiah chapter 9. And it said in Nehemiah 9 and verse 31, uh, that chapter gives us a bit of a, an abbreviated history of Israel. But in chapter 9 and verse 31, it says, Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. And we looked at that chapter, and it kind of gives an overview of Israel's history and how they kept wandering away from God, and God in His grace would not destroy them. He would discipline them. He would send in a nation to take them over or take them captive or, or somehow uh, to punish them a little till they would understand that God was showing them His love and trying to bring them back. We realized from that chapter these lessons about God's grace that when we when we realize the value of God's grace, His Word becomes important. Confession is inescapable. Worship is inevitable. Doing right is individualistic. I've got to make the decision. Doing wrong may require intervention. God may say, I need to step in here because you were way out of line. And true repentance will be intentional. We will make that decision to say, I was wrong. 
I am sorry. So the background of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah is that they had been taken captive into Babylon. There were Daniel and all those people and the three Hebrew boys were captives, and many others in Babylon. Now God was allowing them to come back and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. They were rebuilding the temple. Ezra kind of led the rebuilding of the temple. And then Nehemiah was at the same time helping, leading the rebuilding of the wall, the, the protective wall around the city, and, and was leading them uh, through it. So last Sunday, of course, was Father's Day, so we, we looked at some dad jokes, and, and we look, actually looked at jokes in the Bible last Sunday night. And we looked in Genesis 17 when God told Abraham and Isaac, uh, told Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have Isaac uh, as a son in their old age, and Abraham laughed, and Sarah laughed, and God said, why are you laughing? I can do anything. So when they had their son Isaac, they named him Isaac because his name means laughter. They said, God, you're telling us a joke, but it's actually a joke to say that anything is too hard for the Lord. Because God can do anything. In Nehemiah, sorry, not Nehemiah, in Numbers chapter 11, um, the people complained that there was bread falling from heaven. They said, all we have is bread. How about some meat? And God said, I'll give you meat. And in our terms, in Numbers chapter 11, he said, I'll give you meat until it comes out your nose. That's a, and, and I think the Bible term is nostrils. It's a little more, I don't know. I, I'd look up the verse, I don't take time to do it. But God kind of says, yeah, you want bread? I'll give you bread. I mean, you want meat? I'll give you meat. I'll give it until it's coming out your nose. It sounds like something a dad would say. But we see that it's a joke to complain about God's provision. God says, I'm giving you bread from heaven, and you're complaining? In Matthew 7, we see it's a joke that you, to think you can judge others. Jesus kind of makes a joke. He said, you want to pick the speck out of your brother's eye when you've got a beam sticking out of yours? I mean, to me, that's a joke. I mean, he's, he's looking at it, you know, you've got a beam sticking out of your eye. And he said, it's, it's basically a joke to think that you can look at others and say, well, you're not doing right. We're not a judge. God is the judge. He makes a joke when he, to, to say that if we think we can get to heaven any other way than through God's grace. One guy left him very sad because he trusted his riches. And God said, you know what, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. I think he was making a joke. I can't prove it. I don't know. You can disagree with me if you like. It's fine. But I think Jesus was trying to get to that point to get you to understand, you know, this is so ludicrous. It's a joke to say that you can get to heaven any other way than through the God's grace. And then he makes a joke about the Pharisees. About ignoring the obvious parts of the Christian life. He said, you're taking your spices, your anise and cumin and herbs, uh, these small spices, and you're dividing them up into ten equal parts so you can give your tithe to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he said, you're omitting the weightier matters of the law, justice and love and mercy. And he goes on to say, he said, you're straining at a gnat, and you're swallowing a camel. Those little black flies this year are driving me crazy, but, and they're not even biting me. Poor little Kaylin, we were at a cabin last week for Eastport, and she looked like she had chicken pox when she came home. I mean, they chewed on her like crazy. But one of those goes in your mouth. I mean, you gag for a little bit, but you can swallow it if you have to, if it flies in there. You're not going to get a camel down there. Jesus, I think he makes a joke. He said, you're straining at a gnat. He said, you can't swallow this, but you'll swallow a camel. He said, you're, you're, you're omitting the obvious parts of the Christian life and focusing on these small things that really aren't as important. And then Psalm 2 and verse 4, I think God has a sense of humor. Because he says he will laugh at the heathen who think they can overthrow or even ignore God. I mean, the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I, I believe that we are made in the image of God. It's a natural thing for us to do, to laugh. And I think the Christian life is to be joyful. I think we've made it complicated, and we've made it sad. So we need to understand this fact of the joy of the Lord being our strength. This was the title I had for last week, and I forgot to use it. But it comes in handy now. 
you got to keep the ha in hallelujah. Amen. Isn't that great? I was so proud of myself for that. You can write it down. You can give me credit. That's fine. If you want to tell people I made it up, I'm okay with that. If you don't want to tell people, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> hallelujah is a transliteration. It means a letter-for-letter -letter translation of the Hebrew phrase, Praise ye Yah, or Yah is the name for Jehovah, or Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah is a transliteration, letter for letter from, uh, I guess, Hebrew, and maybe it went through Greek, I don't know, but it's into English. We get Hallelujah, which means Praise ye the Lord. So today, I want to look at this passage as this thought, this phrase kept coming to me this week as I, I heard of tragedy and sorrow and pain and, and just trying to deal with all of that. How the true joy... It has to come from more than telling a few jokes and a little bit of lighthearted laughter. I mean, a few dad jokes, yeah, that's great. It, you know, it brightens your day, but that's not true joy. You know, Pastor Fury and I have a great relationship, and, and we send messages back and forth. We're always sending jokes and those things. And, but this, to me, these days, it's, I, I'm not sending him the same jokes. I'm not trying to be as It's a hard time for him. And a few lighthearted jokes will probably help him a little bit to, to, you know, take away some of the stress or maybe give him something else to think about. But in a situation where there is sorrow or pain, there needs to be more than just that surface happiness. There needs to be true joy to really praise the Lord. So I want you to learn today how to have true joy in the Lord so you can praise Him in all situations. Keep the ha and hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, help us in the next few minutes uh, to gain some truth from this passage of Scripture. Your word, which we heard this morning, was written so that our joy would be full. Lord, we want more than happiness. We want joyfulness. We ask that you would uh, show us from your word this morning uh, something that will help us. And Lord, I pray that if each person here will gain something from something I say, that would be an added bonus. But Lord, I pray that your word and the Holy Spirit would do its work this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate, from the morning unto the midday, before the men and the women, and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, and Shema, and Ananiah, and Urijah, and Hilkiah, and Maasiah, on his right hand and on his left hand, Padiah and Mishael and Malchiah and Hashem and Hashpadina and Zechariah and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also Jeshua and Bani and Sherebiah, Jamin, Achub, Shebathiah, Hodajiah, Maasiah, Kelita, Azariah, Jozebat, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, and caused them to understand the reading. Now we read those verses a few weeks ago, but I left out all the names, and someone challenged me that I couldn't read the names, so I had to prove I could read the names. But if you see here, Ezra picked up the Bible and began to read it. And the people, the Bible says in verse 3, they stood from morning until midday, which was probably from 9 o'clock to noon. At least three hours they stood and listened to the Word of God. The Bible says the ears of all the people were attentive unto the law. And then the Bible says as they listened, Ezra stood up, and he opened it and read it, and he caused the people, in verse 7, to understand the law. Verse 8, he read in the law of God distinctly. 
and gave the sense. He said, this is what it says. This is what it means to you. This is what God's word. He was reading the Old Testament law, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He was reading this and he said, now I am helping you understand what this means for you as a person. And the Bible says in verse number 9, Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. The people stood for at least three hours while Ezra read from the scriptures, and God convicted their hearts of sin, and they began to weep and mourn and confess their sin. And Nehemiah said to them in verse 10, Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto your Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I want you to see this morning that if we're going to truly have joy in the Lord, repentance must, will lead to refreshment. They read the word of God. It convicted them of their sin. They said, we have done wrong. If you remember, we looked at in Ezra, they had intermarried with the other nations. They had married into idol-worshiping nations and it had drawn them away from God. That's why God had brought them into captivity to help them understand, don't worship idols, worship me only. So now that they were coming back into the city of Jerusalem and rebuilding it, they understood they were worshiping idols. Now they said, we need to make this right. And they confessed their sins. And Nehemiah said, okay, now you've confessed them. Let's stop the mourning. Let's rejoice. Now that you know the truth, now that you've made it right, let's live right. The Bible says there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And when the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, when he says, you have done wrong, when the scriptures speak to us and we say, I have stepped outside of the boundaries that God has laid out for me in his word, I have sinned. We ought to repent. We ought to remove that weight of sin and that guilt of sin and rejoice in the refreshment and the renewal of strength. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. The Bible says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Proverbs 17, 22. But a broken spirit drieth the bones. God understands we need refreshing. In Exodus 30, 23, 12, Six days shalt thou labor, and on the seventh day thou shalt rest. That thine ox, thine ass may rest, the son of the handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed. The Bible actually says God, on the seventh day of creation, rested and was refreshed. To set an example for us. Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 19, got to the point where he was serving God, and he was doing so much for God, that when he finally accomplished some great things for God, he went and sat under a tree and said, God, kill me now, I can't take any more. And an angel came to him, you know what the angel said? Eat this, go to sleep. And the angel came and woke him up, and said, alright, you need to eat again, now go back to sleep. Twice the angel fed him, and let him take a nap, and the Bible says he went and in, for 40 days in the strength of that meat. Sometimes a rest and a snack is probably all you need. <laughs> but God understands sin is a weight he doesn't want us to bear. God doesn't want us to carry our sin around like a big sack on our backs weighing us down. David said in Psalm 38, 4, My iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. He said in Psalm 40, 12, Innumerable evils have compassed me taking hold on me. And, and we sin against God and we hold on to that sin and, and, and we won't confess it, we won't forsake it, and we let it weigh us down and weigh us down until finally the guilt is too much for us to bear. When God provided a way for us to repent of our sin by the shed blood of His Son on the cross, so we would not have to carry it. So we could be daily refreshed by Him. He says to them, Go. Eat the fat and drink the sweet. He said, go have something good to eat. Have a feast. That's the, those phrases mean to go have a feast. Eat, eat the, the big fancy meals and send portions to them for whom nothing is prepared. Because holiness leads to helpfulness. 
Send portions to them for whom nothing is prepared. You know, when we are sad, when we're discouraged, when we're downhearted, we tend to be very self-centered. We don't notice other people. We think about our own pain. We think about our own guilt. We think about our own problems. And the Israelites here were mourning their sin, which they should have. They mourned and they confessed and, they, and now Nehemiah said, now you need to forsake it. And he said, the time for mourning is over. Your sin has been confessed. It's been forsaken. Let's start reaching out. The portions for the poor. Uh, from this commentator he said, a deep sense of their national sins impressively brought to their remembrance by the reading of the law and its denunciations affected the hearts of the people with sorrow. Notwithstanding the painful remembrances of their national sins which the reading of the law awakened, the people were exhorted to cherish the feelings of joy and thankfulness associated with a sacred festival, and they were uh, observing a, a festival mentioned in Le Leviticus chapter 23, and by sending portions of it to their poorer brethren so that they would enable them to participate in the public rejoicings. Because in Leviticus 23, what they're talking about was this festival they were having. And in Deuteronomy 16 and verse 11, it says, Thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant, thy maidservant, and thy Levite, which is in thy gates, and the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow that are among you. They were to help the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow. They said, if you're going to go and have this big feast, if you're going to have this big celebration, then you need to give portions to the poor, that maybe don't have what you have, so they can also celebrate God's goodness. You are to help them. You are to bring portions to the poor. You are to be a friend to the fatherless. The Bible says in James 1.27 that pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. It's not go to church and be a good neighbor. It's not uh, don't tell lies and don't swear. It's to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Two things. Be a friend and be holy before God. Visit the fatherless and widows. Keep yourself unspotted from the world. In Deuteronomy 16, it said they were to help the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. We're to be a friend to the fatherless. We're to work for the widow. In Isaiah 1.17, it says, plead for, plead for the widow. Zechariah 7.10 says, I'm oppressed not the widow. And in 1 Timothy 5, if any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. A lady that has had her husband die, now she needs someone else to help her. And the church and Christians are to rally around her and help. And that's a, a Bible principle from way back in the Old Testament. We're to give portions to the poor, poor, befriend to the fatherless, work for the widow, and have strength for the stranger. Have you ever met someone in your life that's come in, you've met them, and then after you've never heard tell of them again, you know, was that a real person? Did I, did, I, did I meet them? We've had some people come into our life, and the Bible says in Hebrews 13, too, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Sometimes God brings people into our life, sometimes to encourage us, sometimes so that we can encourage them. But whatever it is, we are to be strength for others. In 3 John chapter 1, it says, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. The Bible is very clear that we shouldn't make differences between people, that we shouldn't treat someone better than the other because they're rich or, or they're our friends or we think they're good people, the Bible says treat everyone the same. doesn't matter what language they speak or what skin color they have. We are to respect and love and be strong and give strength to anyone that we can help. And today in our world we have phrases like pay it forward and random acts of kindness. They're Bible ideas. They're nothing new. <laughs> the Bible says be kind. Strengthen the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees, Isaiah 35 and verse 3. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance. Tell people God can help them. Nehemiah said, listen, you've confessed your sins. 
Now, go and rejoice in God's goodness and get your focus off yourself. Help someone else. Your holiness will lead to helpfulness. And then your relationship will lead to rejoicing. The joy, verse 10 of Nehemiah 8, the joy of the Lord is your strength. David said in Psalm 28, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth. If you've got a Bible open, find the book of Isaiah. I'd like you to see these couple of verses. The book of Isaiah, chapter number 12. I'm just going to get you to turn to two passages of Scripture. I'll make a couple of quick comments and we'll be done. Isaiah, chapter 12. Verse 1. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee, though thou wast angry with me. Thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortest me. Verse 2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. God is our strength and our shield. Our salvation, our relationship with God is where we draw water from. Out of a well, a never-ending supply. The springs of living water that come up within us. Thou, therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. In Isaiah 61 and verse 10 it says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. God has blessed us. When we know him as our Savior, we have that relationship, then we can draw the joy from him. We sang this morning from our hymn book, Rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 4 and verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. You say, how can I just get joy from God? How does that happen? I can't explain it to you. Because in Philippians chapter 4 where it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. A little later it says, If you put your faith in God, He'll give you peace that passes understanding. So I can't explain it to you. Unless you fully experience it yourself. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ and say, I'm a sinner, please forgive me. And you accept Jesus Christ into your life. You have that relationship with him and he gives you the peace. And he gives you the joy. And you will not understand it if you have not put your faith in him. And you can't, you can't understand it for me. I can't explain it to you until you put your faith in him. We read from 1 John in verse 1, uh, verse 3. Of chapter 1. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. That ye also may have fellowship. A relationship with us. And truly our fellowship. Our relationship is with the Father. With his Son Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you. That your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. Let me read to you what this commentator said. I, just, I love the way he worded it, so I'll read it to you the way he has it. About the instance here in Nehemiah. Surely this was the first public Bible reading. When will the people be again as hungry for the word of God as these Jews who stood in the open space from early dawn till the scorching noon? What reverence for the word. When Ezra opened the book, all the people stood up. What holy worship. When he blessed the great God, all the people answered, Amen, Amen. What a model to us all. They gave the sense so that they understood what searching of heart the people wept when they heard the words of the law. There is nothing which weakens us so much as does unrestrained remorse. Contriteness of heart is wholesome and helpful, but excessive grief incapacitates us for our duties. It is well, therefore, to cultivate holy joy, the joy of sin forgiven, of acceptance with God, a hope that anchors us to the unseen and that cannot be ashamed. You may not be able to joy in yourself or your surroundings, but you may always rejoice in the Lord. Keep the ha in hallelujah.
Keep the joy in praising the Lord. Repent of sin. If there's something in your life that's hindering your joy, it's probably sin. Repent. It may be the sin of bitterness. It may be the sin of discontent. It may be any kind of sin. Whatever it is that's holding you back, confess it and forsake it. And then when you've taken care of your sin and your relationship with God, then you can focus on others and help them. Not judging them, not telling them where they're wrong, telling them, hey, God loves you, and I'm going to help you. I'm going to do whatever I can that will encourage you and meet your needs. Those that cannot help themselves, the Bible said, to, to the poor and the fatherless and widows that just need someone to come alongside and say, hey, there is someone that cares. And then rejoice that you know Jesus as your Savior. It's that relationship with God that's going to make the difference. It's not the dad jokes that are going to give you joy in the tough times. It's not just the keep the stiff upper lip. It's the relationship with Jesus Christ that will give you joy and peace that passes all understanding. The joy of the Lord shall be your strength. I trust that you know Jesus as your Savior today. If you do, maybe you need to confess some sin or maybe you just need to thank God for the relationship you have with him. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you can pray right where you sit. If you're home and you're watching online, you can, uh, wherever you're sitting at home, you can pray and ask Jesus to be your Savior. It's a simple prayer of faith saying, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I trust you alone for my salvation. God understands your heart. So if you need Jesus as your Savior, talk to him today. If you need help, we'd love to help you after the service. I'd gladly take my Bible and, and help you understand it more clearly if you need that today. But the Lord wants us to be joyful, to live in His strength. If we try to live in our own strength, we're going to be discouraged. If we live in His strength, we'll have joy. Our Heavenly Father, we come to the end of our service today and asking that you will help us, Lord, to understand there is joy to be had in Jesus. Lord, we can look in so many other places, but Lord, only true joy can be found in you. And Lord, I pray this morning that each person that has heard your word here today will understand their relationship with you is what makes all the difference. And Lord, I pray this morning for your hand to be upon our hearts and lives. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? And we're going to sing just the chorus to this great hymn, Grace, Grace, God's Grace, Grace That Will Pardon and cleanse with it. We'll sing that through once. If you need to pray this morning, you go ahead and talk to the Lord while we sing. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse with it. Grace, grace, this morning. I hope God's word helped you. You are dismissed.